Welcome to another science video where we are going to be looking at some more applications of waves. In this video, I'm Jeremy Krug, and here we're looking at applications of sound waves. Now, in the last video, we said that physical objects vibrate at certain frequencies. When a sound wave is able to match the frequency at which the object vibrates, well, that object will actually be able to resonate, and it actually amplifies the sound. Now, in the last video, we talked about how if you are able to get a sound that hits that resonance, that resonance can actually cause glass to shatter. Now, it's hard to do, but you can actually have certain sounds that will cause glass, like a, like a glass, a, a crystal cup, or some more, uh, even a glass window, to shatter if you get the right frequency and the right loudness, too. We talked about also how high energy sound waves can cause your eardrums to rupture. So if you're around uh, very high intensity sounds at a very high decibel amount uh, number, you should wear earmuffs or some type of hearing protection to protect your ears. Now, sound waves not uh, can not only just resonate through an object, they also reflect off of objects as well. And that's something that we normally call an echo. So if you've ever been in a stadium or some sort of a sports arena where someone is talking or there's some sort of a, uh, an announcer uh, talking, you hear an echo there because the sound is actually reflecting off of the stands or off of the walls or off of the concrete. And it's reflecting and you hear that echo. Now, that can actually be used to the advantage of several living things. For example, let's say we have one of these things, which is a bat. And we know that bats find their food by means of sound waves. And so these bats are trying to find these little insects here. So here's a little a bug, some sort of an insect. And the way that bats find these insects, especially in a dark cave, is they have this high shrieking sound that they emit. So the, uh, the bat will give off this high shrieking sound. Sometimes it's so high that we as humans can't even hear it. And so it is actually able to hit that insect and it reflects off of the object and it comes back in the direction of the bat. And the bat is able to hear that reflection with its big ears that you can see right here. So what's happening here? Well, that's a process called echolocation. So the, the sound is practically echoing off of the bug and coming back in the direction of the bat. And the way this works is that if the wavelength of the bat's shrieking is about the same size as an insect, well, the bat can tell that there's an insect there and actually locate, that's why it's called echolocation, it can actually locate where it is. It's kind of like radar almost with sound waves here. Notice that the bug is small, and so in order to locate the bug, you're gonna need sound waves that have a short wavelength wavelength about the size of the bug. So you would need a high frequency, you know, short wavelength, high frequency in order to locate the bug. So animals can do this, bats can do this. How about uh, in our own technology? Uh, can we do this? Well, yes we can. Sonar on a submarine works pretty much the same way. So here's the submarine, and maybe that submarine is trying to find something just for argument's sake, let's say that, it, that the submarine is trying to find whales. And I don't know why they'd be trying to find whales, but let's just say that uh, they are. So here's a whale, and the sonar on this submarine has some sort of an emitter there, and so it's able to transmit this, these sound waves, and those sound waves hit the whale, and then they bounce off the whale and come back and hit the receptors on the sonar of the submarine. So what's happening here? Well, notice that in this case, in order for the, the submarine to pick up the whale, the wavelength of that sonar has to be about the same length as the whale. And so if that's the case, the sonar is gonna be able to pick up the location of the whale or whatever other object is about the size of a whale. So in this case, notice that we have a large object that we're trying to pick up. So we need a longer wavelength, which is a lower frequency, right? Long wavelength means lower uh, frequency here. And as a result, 
the sonar on the submarine is going to be really good at the picking up whales, but it's not going to be very good at all at picking up uh, mosquitoes. And I don't think there are mosquitoes uh, swimming around in the middle of the ocean, but if we're talking about things that are about the size of a mosquito, like um, little tiny little, little tiny fish, the sonar is not going to pick those up very well either. It's kind of like a bat. That bat is really good at picking up the location of the bugs. It's not going to be good at picking up the location of uh, at the at the location of like a a person or something like that. Now, if we think about another application of sound waves, what happens when you move toward the sound wave? Well, let's imagine that we have an ambulance here, and the ambulance is uh, is emitting a siren. You've heard an ambulance siren before, and you're moving toward that. Uh, that siren. Well, how does it sound to you? Well, as you move toward the sound, notice that you're actually able to perceive more wave cycles than you would if you were stationary. You're picking up more. You're like uh, catching up to the wave. So you're actually uh, hearing, uh, actually from your uh, ears point of view, the pitch seems higher than it would otherwise be. And so what that means is, you know, the ambulance siren has a certain pitch. To you, it sounds like it's higher. That's called the Doppler effect. And this basically tells us that the perceived frequency or pitch of a wave is higher when the source of that wave is getting closer to you or you're getting closer to the source of the wave. Now, it works in the opposite direction as well. If you move away from a wave, so here's the ambulance, maybe it's moving away from you and you're running away from the ambulance too, well, guess what? You're actually going away from the source of the wave. So that means that your ears perceive fewer wave cycles than you would hear if you were stationary. So what that means is that ambulance has a certain pitch, has a certain frequency to it, but you're hearing it as if it were lower. So it's going to sound lower. Now that's the other part of the Doppler effect. So what that means is when the source of the wave is getting farther away from you, it makes the, it makes the sound go lower. Now we can actually demonstrate this. Uh, in the uh, a description of this video, I have a link to a, a very short clip of an ambulance, uh, of something just like this, and it's doing basically this thing. You'll hear that as the ambulance gets closer to you, it sounds like the pitch is distorted upward, and as the ambulance moves away from you, the pitch is distorted downward. And maybe this is something that you've heard before, perhaps in a uh, like an ambulance or a police siren or something like that, and that is exactly how that works. And you can have a chance to look at that video in the uh, description. Let's talk about the speed of sound waves very uh, briefly before we end this uh, discussion here. The speed of sound waves in air, it's about 767 miles per hour. I mentioned in an earlier video that you know, usually in science we use meters per second, but since this is an integrated science class, I want you to give a, and just get an introduction to some of these concepts. It's okay to use miles per hour for this. If we do some mathematics on this, we find that 70, whoops, 767 miles per hour is actually the same as sound traveling one mile in about 4.69 seconds. One mile travels in 4.69 seconds for sound. If you want to just round that off, we can say that sound travels about one mile in about five seconds, if you want to say that. So here is some lightning. You can see lightning, can't you? And then what do you hear after the lightning? You hear the thunder, don't you? Thunder is basically just the sound of lightning. You know, when lightning takes place, it, it, it causes the air around it to be superheated. And the thunder that you hear is just the sound of that rapid expansion of the air around that lightning bolt. And how that works is when you see lightning, the light from that lightning hits your eyes almost instantly. You know, light travels so fast that it's practically instantaneous. You will see lightning very, very quickly. But sound travels much more slowly. You know, sound travels a whole lot more slowly. So as a result, 
if you want to find out how far from you or how far away from you the lightning is, count the delay between the lightning and the thunder that follows it. And so you can actually use the, the difference between the speed of sound and the speed of light to see how far away from you that lightning is. If, it's, if you see that lightning and then count to five, you know, one, two, three, four, five seconds, and then you hear that boom of thunder, you know that that lightning was about a mile away from you. If you hear that lightning or see the lightning and then it's about 10 seconds, then you know that the lightning's about two miles away from you. On the other hand, if there's lightning and almost instantaneous thunder, well, that lightning is pretty close, isn't it? So you can actually use this to your advantage to kind of understand how far away from you lightning is and if you're in much danger during a storm. Well, I hope you learned something from this video. If you did learn learned something about the applications of sound waves, then I hope you'll uh, give my video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. I have lots of science videos and mainly chemistry videos on here. Uh, I'm Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching science for over 21 years, and I hope that you've learned something from this video today. Uh, join me again where we can learn some more science together.